Hello there. Hey. Yeah. Who are you? I'm Noah. And who am I? You're Adam. Very nice. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. This is not how to shake hands. Well, that doesn't really matter at this point. And what are we here to talk about today? Well, um, a fan email. Well, I would use the term fan loosely. I'm well, not some, someone, myself. someone emailed us. I have the email right here. May I read it? From Mr. Turkey Bowler. And he has not heard this name before, so I'm sure... This is my first time hearing the actual email. Verbatim. Two Team Genesis presents... Hey! With two exclamation points. I have been on YouTube the last couple of weeks, looking at comic book reviews, and I have to say, you guys are great. Why, thank Thanks! I am just getting into comics, and I was wondering if you could give me some suggestions. I really like Superman, so what story arcs should I read first? Now... This brings us to an interesting position. Now, what could we do here? I think we could try to list off some really good Superman stories or arcs that everyone should read, but I don't really think that that's a good approach, because that's generally not my approach to making recommendations. Especially with something like Superman, where you have a lot of material and a lot of different... 70, 80 years of history. Pretty much the longest-running superhero in comic books ever. Mm -hmm. by virtue of being the first superhero in comics ever, not counting as a Tara. So yeah, you've got a lot to work with, and it's really hard to say, hey, read this. Especially since Superman, I think, is a character who gets a lot of, I'm not going to say criticism, but there are differing ideas about what the best way to write him is. And there are a lot of people who say that you really can't write Superman well. Have you heard this? Yeah. I've definitely heard this. And I can only write people around Superman. That's one of the prevailing philosophies. Mm -hmm. So I think that here the best thing to do would be to take a look at a handful of Superman stories or books that we particularly like or that we think have some particular qualities that one might want to look into. Not necessarily the very best ones, but just some uh, that really showcase certain aspects of the Superman story and talk about them. Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, yeah. And that's why we're making this video. Go ahead with that. So go ahead and talk. Okay, um... Well, one that just comes to mind, uh, the recent All-Star Superman. All-Star Superman. Do you want to talk a bit about what All-Star Superman is? Okay, so All-Star Superman, um, was... 2009. 2000, 2009. I thought it was... Whatever. Because the movie came out and... Yeah, uh, they recently made a movie of that, if you don't like reading. Um, <laughs> if you don't like reading, please. Yeah, so... Back away. <laughs> um, but All-Star Superman was a... I forget exactly if it was supposed to be like a reboot or a mini-series. I, I forget. I think... Well, eventually it be, just became like a mini-series. It a mini-series. It became a mini-series. It's a mini-series now. Of, um... Kind of... It begins... I don't know how to do this... Okay. You okay. All Star Superman yeah. is a series written by Grant Morrison from what I believe to be 2009. It chronicles the story of Superman in a world taking place outside of the main DC continuity. The idea behind the All Star comics was to give readers a jumping on point. This was before the idea of just rebooting the whole universe, so that people who weren't entirely familiar with the entire universe uh, didn't have to walk in and have no idea what was going on. It was to provide a simplified story that readers could be comfortable with reading and picking up without having years and years of continuity. Um, the other book in the All-Star line that was released was All-Star Batman and Robin, which has a reputation for being absolutely terrible, mostly mm -hmm. because it is, but we're not going to be talking about that today. We're talking about the good one. Interestingly enough, this is where we differ, but yeah. no one wanted to mention it, so I think okay. we should. So, so interestingly enough, also, if you're going to be... Sorry to cut you off. Uh, if it, we are talking about starting places, not a bad starting place, just because mm -hmm. that's its purpose. Yeah. So, uh, the story, basic premise behind All-Star Superman, is that, uh, Morrison is kind of running with the idea that Superman is this all-powerful, godlike being. Um, in the beginning of the book, he gets this even more so. Uh, Superman gets some sort of, uh, how to describe it? I guess... He's overcharged, basically, and all this extra power is slowly killing him. He goes to the sun. Yeah, he goes and, and like, hugs the sun. Into the sun. And it gives him super, like, more superpowers. Because, of course, <laughs> Superman is solar-powered, so being in the sun overcharges his cells, and so he's slowly dying of some sort of solar cancer. Um, 
before he does, he decides to uh, use all of this power to uh, do a whole bunch of things, mostly save the world, sometimes create worlds, and he does a bunch of, it's kind of like Hercules Trials type things, like, anyway. This is a good yeah. uh, comparison. So he does all of the, all this super stuff. And let's not talk about yeah, I'm not how gonna, it resolves. Yeah. But I think it resolves pretty well. It doesn't, I don't think. Yeah. I'll, uh, to be honest, I wasn't really very, uh... I can talk about why I don't particularly like it in a second. Why do you think it works? I think it works because, unlike a lot of other Superman comics, where you have this invincible person, and it's about trying to beat him, or trying to overpower him, uh, they just run with the fact that he's not going to... That nothing is going to kill him, that he's just going to end up dying. Um, not killing himself, but he is just going to end up dying. Um, so he has to work within a, uh, I don't want to say arbitrary, but, but a, uh, like a, like a fixed time. Like, he, he's going to die. He has to beat up the clock. Yeah, he has to beat the clock. Um, but besides beating the clock, he has nothing working really against him. He could just cut through everything else. So it's about what he does with this unlimited power in this very limited time. And, uh, you know, what, what will be Superman's magnum opus is, uh, and what, what will be, why do we remember Superman? And what does someone do with all this power? So a lot of people say that it's difficult to write Superman mm -hmm. because he's pretty much invincible. I've heard in other media when someone is, uh, when a hero is seen as being too overpowered or too indestructible, they'll be likened to Superman. He's yeah. like the standard for that. And that doesn't really create conflict. Do you think that this book does a good job of creating an interesting story by avoiding that altogether? Yeah. Um, because then we're not focusing on how Superman will die, or if Superman will die, or what will kill Superman, or can Superman live through this. We're focusing on what happens in between uh, all the conflicts. We're focusing on what... Superman does, not how will he, but what will he. I think that's a very interesting point. Personally, um, I there's... I think so too. I'm sure that's why you made it. Personally, I myself don't have a very strong interest in um, All-Star Superman, mostly not because I think it's badly written, necessarily. It's certainly well done, as is, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. It's, it's certainly well done. More so, my problem is that, for me, it's not a Superman story. I think that the essence of the conventional Superman story, I mean, it's definitely not conventional, but I think that the essence of the Superman story is that of Superman facing a challenge that needs to be overcome. Mm -hmm. I think the question doesn't necessarily have to be how is he going to overcome it? But I think that the question, I think that there still needs to be that sort of a challenge. This is just more of a exploration of the idea of what Superman could do. That doesn't necessarily make it a bad story. And if that's, uh, it's an interesting premise. And if you personally find, take interest in it and the way that it's explored, then I strongly encourage you to, or if the idea sounds intriguing to you, I strongly encourage you to check it out. I just think that, personally, for me, it gets away from what it is that I look for in stories about Superman. And then my other problem with it was just that, structurally, it has a very sort of, um, I like books that are very art-based. Um, this is more, would you say it's more episodic? Yeah, it's kind of more serial. Yeah, well, no, serial would be art-based, episodic. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's episodic. Yeah, Everything think so. kind of cut into neat chunks. Yeah, it kind of with just only goes... some continu continuity. It's around. an idea that we go from issue to issue to the point that each issue feels kind of like a vignette as part of a larger yeah. story. And that just, for me, I feel like a lot of the potential of those stories and a lot of the interesting things in those stories um, don't really get explored as well as they could. If I could um, just give an example, this is early on, this is in like issue four. Uh, Superman discovers black kryptonite, and mm -hmm. it turns him evil. So Superman is going to destroy the world. So in order to stop him, Jimmy Olsen has to turn into Doomsday. Yeah. That is amazing. It is. And I love that it's there. I love that it's happened. That it happens. I don't really feel like we get much of a payoff from it. But again, that's more my response personally than a criticism of 
as a story works. So again, I do think that it's something worth checking out. Um, also, I know we're talking about story. Uh, I think we should probably very quickly mention artwork just because it is a comic book. Okay. Um, I think it's pretty. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's uh, colors, and I guess this happens with Superman a lot. Colors are really saturated. Um, there's a lot of light you focus on that, especially with this one. Um, Superman... Like, even if you just look at the, the cover, I don't I know wish, the I wish that cool. I had my copy. Sorry, I wish we had my copy just so that I could but actually it's, show some pictures. It, it, it really is just kind of, it, it plays up this whole sun and, uh, like, this Jesus thing. Superman just, like, cradling the earth, looking down, like, aww. It, but also, and, and all the colors are really saturated. You have really bright blues and reds. But I wouldn't necessarily say it's bright, because while there is a lot of color, I wouldn't say it's very intense. I think that the way that everything is drawn, we get a very soft feeling. That it's not like a very hard, intense... And it's not like fight, neon. Fight, fight. It's, I mean, not, not even in terms of brightness, just in terms of that intensity. That it's not like the kind of thing where it's leaping out at you and hitting you in the face, which a lot of art actually does, and which can be done very well. But I think this is much more... Just creates the sense of a much more benevolent world in which this mm-hmm. stuff takes place, which I think works very well and is very important. As a friend of ours put it, um, you weren't there. Uh, wasn't he there. saw the cover and he was like, "Oh, Superman is high. <laughs> um, he's not high." That's the kind of thing that he says all the time. Um, anyway, so All Star Superman, not my favorite, probably high up on your list, it, I think we would both say it's worth investigating. It's definitely worth investigating. Um, I have to, should we say our favorite parts? Or? I don't really think okay. so, because I don't think we really need to get into that much of yeah. the story okay. details. But uh, I was, what really stuck with me was the ending, so. Yeah. Um, moving on. Mm-hmm. This is something that I'm pulling out of here, and I have a copy. It's Probably on these, even though I don't really like Monster Superman, it's probably the one that seems the most arbitrary and the one that probably has the least uh, reputation here. But we're looking at Superman Brainiac. That's Brainiac right there. Uh, Why am I putting this on? I have to admit, unfortunately, it's kind of because I really like Brainiac. Um, but and Jeff Johns. He but there's a there. reason there. Well, yes. Uh, first off, this is part of Jeff Johns' run on Su- Superman uh, during the 2000s. This is also pretty recent. This is... 2004, I think? I will check the copyright date as I'm talking, because I'm pretty sure it was later in 2004. But um, anyway, 2008. There oh. we go. So, hmm. also around the same time as All-Star Superman in this universe... The story here is that um, Brainiac comes to Earth and tries to steal a thing. Or rather, Superman has to fight Brainiac to get revenge on him for stealing Kandor. It's essentially the standard Brainiac story, being told kind of again and reintroduced in a way that clarifies elements of it, but that's really not the important part. What's important is, I guess, why I'm putting this on here. Not... A particularly epic story. It's not even that long. Uh, it really is the sort of thing. <clears throat> it really is the sort of thing that is more a sample in a much larger body of work because there is. This is really the launching point for a lot of Jeff Johns' run on Superman. It's really <clears throat> segues directly into the. I don't know if even mentioning it is giving something away. It segues into the new Krypton story arc and all of that. But really what I like about it is that it's the sort of Superman story that's not so much an exploration of Superman, but it's an exploration of, number one, not in detail, but just one that very strongly uses uh, Superman's supporting characters. Um, Just Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, the folks at the Daily Planet, they appear... And the Kents. And the Kents, and also Supergirl. Not so much Supergirl, but including Supergirl. They appear from time to time. They're not driving the story. But uh, this book and Jeff Johns, more than a lot of people, I think, creates a very real world for Superman to exist in and creates actual people who inhabit this world, even if some of them are already kind of characters, kind of throwaway. I'm talking about a lot of the Daily Planet characters. Yeah. Um, it still uh, suggests that Superman is existing in this place where even when this isn't something that's this directly... Guy, this guy sucks. Uh, we're talking about the jerky sports writer. Ha ha ha. 
He eats donuts and throws footballs around and annoys everyone. Yes. But um, beyond that, since he's not the focus of this, the fact that we have characters like this and the fact that Superman is creating, is existing with all of these background characters really, uh, I think, makes the Superman story a lot more engaging and just makes it feel like what's happening is a lot more real. When we do get to the point where Metropolis is in jeopardy, we actually feel like there's a metropolis for us to care about. Full of people that we know and care about. Exactly. The same thing with um, the Kents. One of the main ideas is the Kents are concerned about Superman's well-being, well even if we, the audience, aren't necessarily concerned about Superman, because he's freaking yeah. Superman. We still feel um, we can identify with what the Kents are caring about, and that actually matters. I think this kind of gets into that all of the good Superman stories are about Superman, the people who are affected by Superman. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good example of how that's not true. This is very much a story about Superman. It's entirely about Superman. Kind of about Supergirl. Mostly about Superman. Partly about Brainiac. Primarily about Superman. But, at the same time, that doesn't make the other characters inconsequential. That a story doesn't have to be about them for them to determine the character of it. I worry that Noah is just flipping through the pages with that. I'm problem. listening. Oh, yeah. Um, I like it, too. Uh, it just seems kind of... But, like, uh, hmm. it, I guess it is one of those quintessential Superman stories, unlike something like All-Star or what we're going to get into uh, after this. Um, that's kind of Superman, but a gimmick. Uh, this is just very much Superman fighting something bigger than him, defending the Earth. And I, I like that. I like it for that. Um, and if you were to just, you know, to, if you're kind of just to ask me, what is Superman at his Supermaniest? Uh, I would probably point in this direction. Um, it's, so it seems almost, and I don't want to, I think saying this might make the book sound archetypal. bad. That... Essentially, what is the Superman at his most normal? Yeah, this, at his this most is typical. It is a very typical Superman story. But that um, doesn't make well, it bad. The plot. What what makes it great is all the characterization and world building that goes into this admittedly short uh, collection. And when you're done, I'm going to one last thing about that. Okay, and um, there is still a threat, and I, I like that. It does set up a threat. Um, very well. Definitely. That's one of the things that stands out mm -hmm. the most for me. That Brainiac is, I will say, my favorite enemy of Superman. Superman yeah. isn't a character who has a lot of very good or interesting enemies. I unlike, resent that. He resents that. But I think unlike someone like Batman, where it's very much about uh, who is being the oppositional mm -hmm. force and this sort of battle between two different... Uh, people trying to accomplish something, a lot of Superman's enemies tend to, I think, just disappear into the background. But, I mean, off the top of your head, for the average person, how many Superman's enemies can you name that are, like, really significant like that? There's Luther, there's Brainiac, and that's pretty... Dark Side, Bungle. Dark Side isn't really one of Superman's enemies, though. He's more tangentially. But that's true. I mean, there is Dark Side, there is Mongol. Mongol doesn't really have very much of a reputation. I guess not. That's it. I mean, He's just pale Dark Side. Kind of and that's unfortunate, but I think that Brainiac demonstrates how there's this whole thing, oh, Superman is really undefeated, undefeatable, you can't really beat Superman, so then what threat is there? Brainiac, okay, he's got probes and machines that will tear you apart mm -hmm. and strap you down and steal all your information and stuff. That's threatening, but also that Brainiac, I think more so than most of Superman's enemies, works as a character. And he's really big. He's really big because, that's it, he's sort of inconceivably big because he's partly biological, mostly a computer program, so he he's can a exist. He is, he's data. He's data. He could exist in and part of anything, mm -hmm. no matter how big or how small, which also makes him very difficult to destroy. But for the most part, just I think that Brainiac as a character makes a very interesting uh, not necessarily just foil to Superman, but also a very interesting threat to Superman and the character who really... He makes one point. Uh, I don't really feel like I'm giving anything away with this, but he says, uh, yeah, you know, you're not a part of Krypton anymore. You don't know anything of their advanced civilization. You're not actually a testament to your race. You're nothing but a brute. Um, as, and that Brainiac is the opposite of that. So I think he's an interesting character. You know, Luther works too. Luther 
is interesting in that sense. Uh, Brainiac is the one who really gets me. So, uh, do we want to, I think we're at 20 minutes here, do we want to perhaps take a break and do the other two in a separate video? Um, I think let's do that. I, th I think we should finish up this. We still oh, have to talk about the art. Oh, do we exactly. want to? I'll mention that. I wanted to mention the art. Of course. Uh, just a few things. I do like the art overall, but there are a few things that, that just kind of get me. One of them has to do... And I know that sounds extremely weird, I'm sure but it it's something that I've only really noticed in this comic. And I've read like the the New Fifty Two or a Superman over after reading this. I read a bunch of these other books. Well, we only have two more that we're going to talk about. But in this one, for some reason, Superman's underwear, like just on the cover, I don't know what it is, but I don't know if it's the belt that kind of seems to have no purpose. If it's the way that the underwear is drawn where it's more like briefs instead of... I mean, where it's more like boxer briefs instead of just... I don't know. But something about the underwear just makes... Like, like I feel like it's constantly riding up on me. <laughs> just the way it's drawn. I don't think Superman can feel that. I don't, I don't also, know why. Also, in the New 52, he doesn't have any underwear. That's why, yeah. Yeah. Perhaps to spare also, the discomfort of... <laughs> Also, Supergirl's face never looks right. That is the unfortunate thing here. That, and I actually really like the art here. I think that it's very effective. I think that um, there's a lot of things that work really well when it tries to get certain things across that don't really look right. It's because they're not supposed to look right most mm -hmm. of the time, and I think that creates a very... Uh, sets the tone very effectively. But the one thing about Supergirl is that she has incredibly pouty lips. And she has this, it seems like she should be completely non-expressive, like some sort of a model in, Botox. Some sort of, in some sort of Botox magazine going, mm -hmm. I can't do it because I don't have pouty lips, but it's like, just the big pout and she stares off apathetically and that's sexy. That seems to be kind of the model for Supergirl here, but the thing is that she expresses this is, a lot. She goes through a lot in this story and a lot of really intense shit happens, stuff happens, so she needs to express a lot and... It's almost as though she physically can't. It's like, you look there. Show, 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 show she's, her. She's incredibly upset about the, Brainiac and really face. concerned. The um, I'll get, I'm just going to try to last. I'm just going to get to that in a second. So. There's, uh, I'm going to try to do this without really revealing anything. Um, there's, I, actually, maybe I'll just go to the angry face. Um, there it is. There's raging Supergirl, but still with the pouty mouth. Mm -hmm. And... Overall, that just gets to be a little bit disgusting. But again, for the most part, it... concern Supergirl. <laughs> but still, the fact that Supergirl's facial expressions don't really add up for me shouldn't disparage no. the good things about it. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say about this, just before I forgot to yeah. say, is that I like how in the story, a big thing is um, that Brainiac isn't really fighting Superman, he's just taking away things from Superman. That's and that true. has a lot to do with Brainiac's MMO. Uh, not MMO. <laughs> MO. Yeah, Brainiac's MO, like, taking information. And that he's taking everything Superman likes. And I think, loves. And I think he's taking ice cream. <laughs> Superman loved ice cream, but then Brainiac took it away from him. Coming this summer, 2012, Kevin Smith writes, Superman, Brainiac. Fortress of Ice cream too. I don't know what I'm talking about here. But again, also, I think that gets at the idea yeah. of, is Superman entirely just Superman the person? Is that what mm -hmm. we care about? Or is the rest of the world what matters in yeah. a Superman story? Okay. So, we will see you again yeah. in another incredibly long video for part two of our response to Mr. Turkey Bowler. <laughs>